Hi, I'm Dr. Casey Holland, and on this channel, we discuss things like Epstein-Barr virus, infectious mononucleosis, chronic fatigue, chronic illness, how to have more energy, and things that are happening in regards to medicine and your health that you may be interested in and looking for answers with. In today's episode, I'm going to do a deep dive into infectious mononucleosis, commonly the first presentation of Epstein-Barr virus, what the top symptoms are, how to understand them, what it's going to look like if you want to get tested, and how to recover from this, as well as whether you're recovering from the first time that you're dealing with this virus, or this is something that it is more chronic for you. All right, so what is infectious mononucleosis. Most of us have heard of mono, otherwise known as the kissing disease, really common for people to be infected with this in middle school, high school, and even, even college. So what is infectious mononucleosis? Infectious mononucleosis is the first time that you are infected with Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus is human herpes virus four. So it's from the herpes family virus, which is an extremely common family of viruses. It's estimated that greater than 90 to 95% of us have been or are infected with Epstein-Barr virus. It's a DNA plasmid alternating between a latent and a lytic cycle. So it has this unique ability to stay in the body. So when you're thinking about this virus, it's important to remember that you're not going to take a round of antivirals or something and just completely clear yourself of it. It's, it's going to be in your body once you're infected with it, but not to worry. Your body is designed to heal and your immune system is designed to keep this virus in a inactive or latent state. So with mono, typically it's considered that this is the first time that your body has had this infection. You might be sick for a few weeks and then you're going to heal. You're going to feel better. The other thing that makes Epstein-Barr virus human herpes virus for unique is that it is the first human tumor virus that was discovered over 50 years ago. What does that mean? What makes it a tumor virus? That means that this virus, when it's active, can turn on different pathways and proteins that promote and make it more likely that we can have abnormal growth or oncogenic behavior. This is also why it's associated with autoimmune conditions. It's currently associated with seven autoimmune conditions, multiple cancers, and that can make it seem really scary for people when they hear about it. So Yes, that infectious mononucleosis, the virus that is causing that is Epstein-Barr virus, which is this first human tumor virus, human herpes virus 4 from the herpes family. So that's the virus that we're talking about. So infectious mononucleosis, though, it's typically thought of as being pretty mild. You might be sick for a few weeks. That's kind of the, the general thought about this. And you might have swollen lymph nodes. You might have an enlarged spleen in, in more aggressive or severe cases, you might have really a lot of fatigue, malaise. It is possible that you, you had this and you didn't even realize it because you just thought it was the flu because it was so mild, depending on you, your immune function, etc. So typically when it's just this first time or an acute exposure to infectious mononucleosis, we have fatigue, we might have fever, inflamed throat, sore throat is very common. And then, like I said, the enlarged spleen, swollen lymph nodes, sometimes it presents with a rash. And, and that is typically what that looks like. Now your doctor, the way that they test for infectious mononucleosis is by doing a, what they call a monospot. This is a blood test and they are going to look at the viral capsid antigen, IgM, IgM are your body's first immune response to this virus. So that's what they will check. If it's positive, then they would say you have infectious mononucleosis. It looks like this is the first time that you've had it. Typically, conventional doctors will tell you to go home, rest, decrease stress, drink lots of fluids, and that it will be self-limiting and that your body shouldn't have problems with it. Sometimes this is the case, which is great. Your body mounts an immune response. You rest, you feel better. Other times it's 
presents a lot differently. Sometimes I will have a patient that says, you know, I had mono when I was in middle school, high school, and it lasted for three months. I missed school for three months. It was really extreme. It was really aggressive. So that's where it can be confusing and people can be confused about what's going on with their health. Why is my body not handling it so well? And is it going to be a problem for me later on in life. Remember, I said that this virus can stay in a latent state and then reactivate and that it's going to stay with you forever. So we don't get rid of this. Now, again, typically it is an active state and not going to cause any problems. But what about when it reactivates? A lot of you have heard of reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. And that's what we're talking about a lot when we're talking about chronic fatigue. Is that correlating? Um, there's been also some research looking into if reactivated EBV or EBV titers is associated with long haul COVID and the presentation of that. So what is reactivated Epstein-Barr virus and what is going on when that happens? So again, reactivated Epstein-Barr virus means that virus that should have been considered self-limiting, that is just going to last for a little while, has gone back into an active state. The problem with when this virus is in an active state is obviously you, you don't feel well, but also like we said, it has those properties that are unique to this virus and this virus family that can promote inflammation and promote abnormal cell signaling which then is why it can be associated with autoimmune conditions and cancers. This is why we don't want that reactivation to happen. Of course, we don't want you to feel sick, but we also don't want this chronic presentation where we could be having increased risk of you developing conditions. And this is where I intervene a lot with patients is helping reduce that risk because we don't want to increase that risk. But also I see a lot of fear around when somebody does have this virus where they see, oh, it's correlated with these autoimmune conditions, these cancers. If I have it, that means that I am going to develop one of these. And it be, having Epstein-Barr virus does not mean that you are going to develop one of those. Like I said, 90 to 95% of people have been infected and exposed in many are regulating the virus and keeping it in an inactive or latent state and not having that happen. So we have this opportunity where we can intervene and prevent that from happening. And understanding what is going on with this virus can be helpful in doing so. So what is reactivated Epstein-Barr virus? It's still Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes 4 virus, where it's going to go from that inactive regulated state to an active cycle. So it's replicating now, it's causing problems. I sometimes tell patients, think of it as a circus where everything was quiet and then the light switch goes on. And not only did the ferret's wheel turn on, but all these other things are going on. So yes, the, the virus turned on, but then it's also pressing on these other pathways that are sending out inflammation and things that we don't want in your body. So when it turns on, it's just a circus. So what are the symptoms if it's reactivated? Is it different than that infectious mononucleosis that first time that you present? What is that like? In the reactivated state, you may also have the same that you have in the acute presentation. So you might have fatigue, um, low-grade fever, inflamed throat, swollen lymph nodes, enlarged spleen. You might have a rash. Other things that you might notice that you might have more joint pain, you might feel anxious or irritable, you might have insomnia, you might have gastrointestinal changes. So again, that's why it can be kind of difficult of, well, what's causing what and what's going on is there's this wide range of symptoms. So sometimes Epstein-Barr virus reactivates and it's because you went through something stressful. You were in a car accident. You had a really rough year. You had a stressful event. And this virus that was at bay, your immune system from the stress is not operating optimally and it triggers this. Stress is one of the top things when I ask people what was going on in the past couple of years, they'll say, well, I was under a lot of stress. So we know that that can trigger 
this, but there's other things that can, that can trigger this reactivation as well. Other viruses, COVID, the flu, things like that, toxins in our environment, anything that can cause the oxidative stress, which we have a whole episode on oxidative stress where we dive into that. So I recommend watching that one too, if you're like, you know, what's going on with oxidative stress, but anything that can cause oxidative stress. So that list gets pretty long. If you're exposed to mold, if you're exposed to some toxins, if you have other infections that you didn't know about, all sorts of things can cause this virus to reactivate. And usually the things that are associated with that reactivation also impact what your symptoms are. And whether this is going to be an acute reactivation that presents similar to infectious mononucleosis and that your body will overcome and resolve in a few months, or if this becomes something where you're in a reactivated state for a longer period of time. And when you are in that state, that is when symptoms can be more pronounced, can be more systemic and also confusing. So we might see again, the anxiety, the insomnia, we might see depression from being fatigued for long periods of time and not feeling like you can do the things that you want to do. I have many patients that have taken time away from friends and family, from things they love, or even work because of their symptoms. They can't keep up with it. When we're in that state, there also might be more brain fog. You might notice low libido and hormone problems. With reactivated Epstein-Barr virus, when it has been in that state for longer times, I commonly see lower hormones. You might have gastrointestinal symptoms. You might notice neuralgias. There could be stress on your liver, your spleen. You might notice EMF sensitivity. Oftentimes, the body then becomes more sensitive to EMFs. One interesting thing that I found with Epstein-Barr virus in the research and a more more reactivated state is that some people report having increased reaction to mosquito bites. Now, why would this be? Why would there be increased reaction to mosquito bites? Does that seem just random? Well, it's not because when you have a mosquito bite or a bug bite, and this research was mainly on the mosquito bites, but I think that, you know, it'd be interesting to see if it was with other bug bites too, but you, you react to that. And when we have this virus that has been active for longer periods of time that's not supposed to be, that is associated with autoimmune conditions and making more of a response, it makes sense that there's this dysregulation in your immune system. We can see that in how you respond to a bug bite. And we might see vagus nerve problems where there's just dysfunction. There's difficulty in you being able to relax. Your thyroid and adrenal system and your nervous system is huge with Epstein-Barr virus. So back to where we were talking, what could cause it to reactivate? That's another thing is just your stress response. Were you in a stressful situation for a really long time and now your body is having trouble regulating that and putting you in a state where safe and it's not creating oxidative stress. So let's review what we talked about. So we have that acute initial mononucleosis presentation, fever, fatigue, inflamed throat, swollen lymph nodes, enlarged spleen, rash. And then once it reactivates, we might have those same symptoms and then we might have some other symptoms to joint pain, gastrointestinal, depending on what was causing this reactivation, what your overall health picture is. And then it, when we're in that state where this has been reactivated for more than three months, you know, I have people that come to me that say they have been dealing with this for years, five years, 10 years. And those type of symptoms are typically more systemic, the joint pain, the brain fog, low libido, low hormones goes on down the list. So when somebody says, I have Epstein-Barr virus, it's very interesting because we have to say, okay, is this the first time that you are showing that you have been infected with this virus? Is this the first time you've ever probably had a reactivation or that you've noticed it? Or is this something that's been going on for a long time that your body has been struggling to get under control? And based on that, 
there may be different symptoms, there may be different labs that we need to look into, and there may be different things that are needed for treatment to overcome it. Then how do you actually recover from this? Because the interesting thing is that when these titers are high, whether it's acute, reactivated, or chronic, all three different types of patients I've had come to me and their doctor has said, well, get your rest, your fluids, it will go away. Every once in a while, sometimes somebody might have been prescribed an antiviral to overcome it. And this is where it gets complicated and there's not a one size fits all answer for everybody. And there's not a, always a straightforward treatment plan. If this is the first time that you've been dealing with mono, this is mononucleosis, it's an acute infection, it is possible that you were exposed to the virus for the first time, your body's going to do what it needs to, and you just need to rest, hydrate, take care of yourself, maybe take some time off from activities, and then you'll recover. That's completely possible. If it is reactivated, usually you need to also have things addressed that were a part of that reactivation. And then if it is hey, this has been going on for years. There's things that we need to look at systemically and holistically to figure out what has been going on. And that's where the treatments can, can really vary and be different. And that's what we will be talking about in our next episode. I'm Dr. Casey Holland, and this episode we talked about what is infectious mononucleosis, what is reactivated Epstein-Barr virus, the top symptoms of Epstein-Barr virus based on you, and if this is a first-time infection or a reactivation, how to test for the initial acute infectious mononucleosis. In the comments below, there will be a link that is sourced and it will have a option for you to click and get my free handout on the complete list of labs for checking in on reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. That will be sent to your inbox and we also have an episode on that if you have questions about that. In our next episode, we're going to dive more into what we need to look at when Epstein-Barr virus is reactivated for the first time or it has been reactivated for a long time. Be well.